In this episode I'm actually going to do something that I've been talking about for months if not years. Yes, I'm finally, finally going to design the planting plan for my own garden. If you're frustrated your garden doesn't look as beautiful as it could, even though you've purchased lots of lovely plants, then help is at hand. Plants are not enough, you have to have a good design layout. And when you combine design with the beauty of plants, that's when the magic really happens. It's our mission here at Successful Garden Design to show you how to do it, and it's much easier than you may think. I'm Rachel Matthews and I've been a professional international garden designer for over 25 years and I teach garden design online. I've been inspired by an article that Anne Wareham shared on Twitter regarding the work of Pete Ordoff, someone who I have adored his work for many, many years. As many of you know that watched the episode where I designed my own garden, I would much rather have had a wildflower meadow than anything contrived, but the garden was designed for the needs of the dog and whoever follows me in this property, assuming they're likely to have a young family, there's lots of lawn. So I don't have a lot of planting space, sadly, but what I do have, I was going to turn into 100% food and medicinal garden so the lure of lots of lovely flowers has been too strong. I'm still going to have some of the herbal plants that I wanted in the garden. Specifically I've chosen remedies that are good for the dog and me but primarily the dog so I'm going to design the garden around those but also the concepts that I've gleaned from looking at Pete's work over the years. So I'll talk you through his style and then I'm going to try and recreate it in a very tiny garden which is going to be tough because his style works much better on a larger scale. So Pete Ordorff has a very naturalistic style. Some may call it prairie because he mixes a lot of grasses in with herbaceous plants. But one of the other key features is the layering effect that he uses. He's an absolute master of mixing plants together so they grow up through one another. And he really takes into account the 3D way the plants combine and the seasons as well. Now his gardens look really good, certainly late summer and autumn when things are established, but I also want them to look good all year round and in the spring. So what he tends to do is put things that come up through other things. So in my planting, I'm going to have things like alliums pop through the grasses. So I've got some sort of spring stroke, early summer interest because when you're using predominantly herbaceous, there's not always a lot there in the spring months. So you've got to be a bit careful with how you do things. But if you use plenty of semi-evergreen or ever evergreen herbaceous, that certainly helps. Some of his work that he's put on Instagram, and there's some really, really stunning gardens here. But as you can see, they're all really big scale projects. And I don't have that space, so I've got to find a way of recreating what he does in a much, much tinier space. And you'll notice he repeat plants a lot. Now, I do that anyway, but Pete does it a lot more than I do. And he plants in blocks, which again is something I naturally do anyway. So the difference with the way I'm going to be doing it is having two plants combined or more popping up through each other. I've always planted in blocks so it's very clear so you get the definition and shape of each plant and Pete does that. He's very careful although he's not scared to repeat shapes next to each other and have a soft blending whereas I tend to go for more defined shapes next to each other so that you can really have clarity in the planting when things aren't in flower. That's quite the key so that you can see there's everything's not a blur of planting which happens very easily if you're not careful. So I'm going to have to repeat the plants more often than I would normally and also learn how to have things come up through other things so that can look very messy very easily if you get it wrong. So I've really started to study the plants and plans that um, Pete 
uses and how he combines things so I'm hoping that I've looked to enough of his work that I'll be able to modify it to one my own tastes and style but also the space it's much easier creating one of his gardens on a larger scale than it is a smaller scale so that is going to be the challenge the other thing that Pete does very successfully is the wildness in his garden is always backed up by some very key defined shapes like you'll see very neat clipped hedging and that structure is very very important because when the garden's very wild you've got to have something for the eye to focus on that is solid almost like a visual full stop and that brings extra clarity so when you've got a looser wilder style of planting you get away with it more easily without having it look a mess because of those clearly defined shapes so let's have a look at my tiny tiny plot and we'll see what I can come up with that's in a style of peat even if I can't recreate it perfectly Okay, so this is where we'd got to last year. I was toying with the idea of getting one of those lovely outdoor saunas. I'm still half thinking about it, but then I'm also thinking, yeah, I want to buy some land and maybe it'd be better to wait until I've got that land and put it there rather than trying to jam it into a garden where it doesn't really fit that well. So, and also because I'm now starting to grow vegetables, I do actually need my... Um, polytunnel so mm. but anyway we've started Pete's work so the first thing I've got to do before I do anything else is get the form and structure in so the simplest way for me to get some shape and form into this garden that's evergreen is going to be with box balls the obvious place would be to have one here and here and then repeating that here and probably there too. So that's four in. It would be nice to continue that. And if there's room in here for one. But anyway, having six of those, one is going to be very expensive, and two, that leads the eye down nicely through the garden. So that repetition in Pete Ordorff's garden is very vital, but most importantly, is getting those structures in place, especially if I don't actually end up having that. Structure's gonna be even more important, but if I do have it, that circular shape with the box ball here and here, as well as up through the garden, again, that's just adding continuity with the circular lawns. So now that's in, now I can run through my list and start to get other things. So here's my very rough note taking from what I've gleaned from looking at Pete Ordoff's work. So I've already made a list of herbs that are good for the dog, so they're gonna go in, as well as a few plants I've already written down that I want to get into the garden. Right, so off we go. Let's see what I can come up with. So here's the very rough and ready first draft. I suspect I've crammed too many varieties of plants in, but for the first one, this will have to do, and then I will refine it in time. Um, apologies for the scribble, but being creative is a very scribbly process, I find. So there's two soft, fluffy grasses I've really put a lot around the garden, so that's going to be the tapestry that binds it together. So Steeper Tenuissima, which looks like very soft hair, and it waves in the wind, and then the pink fluffy grass called Mullenbergia. Now I've never actually used that before, so I'm hoping it's not too invasive, and also I'm hoping it's not the rather intense shade of candy floss pink that I've seen in some of the photographs. I'm hoping they've been photoshopped and it's actually a softer, gentler shade because I don't want it to be that bright. So if the other photographs I've seen where it's a gentler colour, that will make me much happier. If it is genuinely that bright, I will swap it because I've used that more than the steeper. So anyway, I've got the soft fluffy pink one here, 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 there. And there. I think that's it. So it's quite a lot. It's gone around the garden a few times. The steeper tenuissima, that's here, here, there was one down here. Oh, there we go. So that's at least, I've tried to repeat things at least three times. Now with the pink fluff, 
I'm also uh, in several of the places some hyssop that I grew from seed last year, lovely deep purple. So that's going to actually be growing up through the pink fluffy grass combination is here, here and here. So I put some evergreens in with a fatinia, arbutus and the acanthus mollis. I've put that in there and here. The sage is evergreen, so are the lavenders more lavenders here and Lemonium latifolium, a sea lavender, that's got quite attractive leaves in the winter and I've repeated that there and there and another interesting grass again I've not used this one it's like a pink barley it's called Hordium jubratum and I've popped that in here and here and I think somewhere else yes there so it's three and coming up through that for some spring interest, because bearing in mind grasses are usually late summer, early autumn, we've got the purple alliums, purple sensation. And I've got those planted in groups of probably five to seven at various intervals around the garden. So, yeah, alliums are everywhere. So, again, that will have a lot of continuity with the colour. Agapanthus is another one. I'm not sure whether I'm going to have white or purple yet, or bluey purple. But anyway, I've got Agapanthus here and here. And I think over here somewhere. There we go, three. So whenever possible, I've repeated things three times. So for a bit of for a difference in shape, I've gone for some purple sedums because it's nice to have some flat level flowers. So we've got that with the purple sedum and the white achillea. The white achillea is wonderful for coughs and colds and all sorts of herbal remedies you can get from that. The dill for the dog, that's gone in here, along with some artemisia. So most of the herbs are in here. And then for some height at the back here, probably an Arunda donax or possibly a black bamboo. Um, little evergreen pine in here. Perovskia here. Some echinops. Oh, and some um, penicetum with the black flowers there. And that will go well with the purple sage. And Calamagrostis, I've got that planted a couple of places. Euphorbia wolfenii for some evergreen and spring colour. Echinacea, again another herb. Oh, and some syllabum marinum, which is milk thistle. Another very good liver tonic. So I will have a think on this, but at least that first draft is finally, finally done after, goodness knows, nearly two years now. Garden designers, gardens and cobbler's shoes, as the saying goes. Hopefully this episode has given you an idea of what can be done, even in a small space, for those of us that love a slightly more natural, wilder feel to our gardens. So until next time, take care. <laughs>